Welcome back, everybody. It is February of 2021, and this is episode 26 of What is on My Desk. So back again for another episode of What is on My Desk. I got uh, quite a bit to go over with you, actually. Uh, a couple of new coins, a couple of new products. Uh, again, not really stuff that I had planned on buying, a lot of impulse buying. Um, I mean, the price was right, don't get me wrong, but uh, it wasn't stuff that I had kind of planned for. So we'll take a look at those coins, we'll take a look at some of the new products, and then we'll get swung over and uh, take a look at the progress on the four kits. Uh, there has been some progress. I have had a bit more free time down here. Plus I'm getting to that point where just a little bit of work means it progresses quite fast. So without further ado, let's get swung over, take a look at how things are going. But before we do that, my name is Sean, and this is Sean's Aviation. And just before we get into the video, um, something I should have been doing a lot more up till now, and that is just asking you guys out there, if you enjoy what you're looking at, if you are if you like what I'm doing, go down below, uh, click on the, the like page, subscribe to my, my channel, and uh, by all means, please click on that little notification bell. If uh, that way you guys get, uh, uh, get alerted when I do get more new content up. I usually try to do the what's on my desk uh, monthly update beginning of the month. And I usually try to get a video or a series of videos released um, by the 15th, the middle of the month. So whether that's going to be a, a tips and tricks video or an aviation history video or my time lapse videos of the previous model builds that I've got done or uh, an air show video or, you know, um, some of my new product review videos I'll be doing. So I want to try to get something posted uh, by the middle of the month. So uh, please, if you're enjoying this, subscribe, like and click that notification bell. Let's move on to the video. So it never fails. Um, I filmed the last month's What's On My Desk, the January uh, What's On My Desk. I filmed the majority of that content on December 30th, and that gave me the 31st to get everything uh, edited, uploaded, and ready to go for you guys um, for the first. And as usual, on December 31st, New Year's Eve, the day I literally had finished editing the video and was rendering it, getting ready to upload, uh, the mail arrived and I received a set of decals. And I attempted to add those decals into the video, but as I'd already basically finished the uh, editing of it and everything else, I bought, I did decide against adding more content. Um, it uh, would have taken a little bit too much effort for me to redo the entire video on such short notice. So I've been saving them and I will include them in this February update. So uh, the idea came around from um, surprisingly tragic, I guess you could say, um, reasons. Um, so if you guys remember uh, a little while ago, I did a review on the Airfix Early P51. The, with the, the tail that did not have the fillet. And uh, I'll throw, if I can remember what month I did that on, I'll throw the link up at the top so you guys can go back and see that review. It's just a basic uh, what's on my desk review. I haven't done an in-depth review on that kit yet, but it was a basic what's on my desk review uh, for that kit. And being an early P51D, I wasn't too sure exactly what I was gonna do it up as. I was trying to find a scheme that was interesting, you know, that I would enjoy having on the shelf, tell a story, but still have that early look to the fuselage. So I did a bit of research online, looked at a couple of different kit uh, decal options. Nothing really jumped out at me as uh, something that was interesting to do until, unfortunately, uh, um, Chuck Yeager passed away not too long ago, uh, probably uh, late last month, late uh, late December, I want to say, late December, uh, sometime early, I can't remember the exact date to tell you the truth, but uh, Chuck Yeager has passed away, um, amazing, amazing person, quite an influence in aviation, for those of you who may not know, he was the first person to break the sound barrier in the Bell X-1, and he had uh, quite a long aviation career, and uh, I had read his biography, autobiography, uh, when I was in like grade school, I think it was like grade six or grade seven, I found his book in the library and, and, and I just absorbed the book. It was an amazing, that's really what kind of got me onto that, that line of aviation books and the stories was reading that and, and, and 
you know, the, the stories he had told about his time in combat and flying the planes. And that's kind of when I decided I needed to learn more and read more. And I wanted to hear more about what was going on. So I, uh, so he was really sort of that uh, early, uh, you know, got me into aviation books early on. So anyways, long story short, I thought, you know what, I should do a tribute to um, Chuck Yeager, you know, do up a couple of planes in, you know, say, you know, P-51 in his markings, the Bell X-1 in his markings, you know, some of the other stuff, like he flew in an F-15 uh, on the anniversary, I think it was the 50th anniversary in 1940, 1996, I believe it was the 50, 40th anniversary, 50th anniversary, and uh, he went up and flew in an F-15 and broke the same barrier again, and the aircraft had the name Glamorous Glennis on, on the nose, which was his, uh, the name he used on the, uh, on the uh, the X1, so I thought you know it'd be kind of a cool idea to have these uh, all done up together. You know what I mean? Have a little like display set up with his model. So the idea came to me. So I started looking for decals, and and the X1s were unfortunately all sold out. They haven't made them for a while. I have a feeling that kits would be released again soon, considering the news that he has passed. So I could not get a Bell X1. Looked at the decals and Glamorous Glennis three, his P51D. Um, many, many decals out there for that, and uh, unfortunately I don't have a D model, and I don't want to add another D model. I already have two uh, built on the shelf, which uh, you guys, uh, if you haven't seen yet, I do have uh, some of the videos out for my P51 built model review. So again, up at the top you'll see a link uh, to the first of the series of my P51 built model reviews. Anyways, uh, I already have two Ds over there. I've got one done up as uh, the Vintage Wings that currently flies. And I've got another one done up as Margie Darling um, in the World War II American um, all bare metal scheme. So I'm like, you know what, I don't want to add another P-51D. Um, but I got looking and I realized that he flew an early model P-51D with a, an early style tail, which is exactly what I have a model of. So then I got on the hunt for Gla uh, the Glamorous Glen 2. Glamorous Glen 2. Glamorous Glen was a P-51B or C. Glamorous Glen 2 was an early P-51D, and Glamorous Glen 3 was his late model P-51D, and then he flew the X-1, which was named Glamorous Glennis. Um, so I thought, you know what, let's get on the hunt for Glamorous Glen 2 decals. I put some feelers out to some decal manufacturers. There is one decal manufacturer I contacted who might actually be doing a tribute page at some point with all of the... Um, Chuck Yeager aircraft on it, but uh, that's down the line. But I did hear uh, someone else got back to me and told me that there was a set of decals by Bullseye Model um, called the P-51D Mustang Yoxford Boys Number 1. And that sheet, which includes a large number of decals through a number of different uh, people, all from the same unit, includes the aircraft that I'm interested in, which is the top one here. Glamorous Glen 2. So I quickly snagged these decals. They didn't cost me much at all. They were, what's the price? There is no price. Um, uh, didn't cost much at all though. They were like less than $20 US. So with a bit of shipping, it kind of ate in my, my, my money. But you know, it's definitely something I'm interested in doing. So I went ahead and grabbed it. So that's the sheet there. Yoxford Boys number one. Bullseye Models 48-009. And um, just so that I get them right, they were all aircraft that were flown by the 357th Fighter Group across a number of different different squadrons. So I'll just go through them all and show you all the ones that are included in the sheet. Uh, so the first one here is uh, 4413897, which is a P51D-5, the early one with the fillet, without the tail fillet, and that one was flown by uh, Chuck Yeager as a Glamorous Glen 2. And then later on in its life, it did have a field mod, a fillet added, and the mirror was removed. So it gives you, the, other than that, uh, there are also some modifications with the invasion stripes. They were lowered down. Uh, but other than that, it's the same aircraft, same basic paint scheme. And uh, um, it's just the difference in the tails and the invasion stripes. But uh, the later one does also include his um, kill markings. I'm probably going to do... This the, obviously the early one with the high invasion stripes with the kill markings on it. I might only do five. We'll see. I'll have to read up some history on his uh, his uh, deeds and see how many of these I can put onto the early model before the fin fillet was added. But I'll do some research on his aircraft and I'll do that one up. So that's aircraft number one. Aircraft number two 
is uh, P51D-5, the early one again without the fillet, and it's 4413897, which actually looking at this is the same aircraft. 3897, so it must be his aircraft earlier on in its life. So it was flown by someone else, Captain Charles Peters, in July of 44, but then it was handed off to um, Chuck Yeager and was named Glamorous Glen 2 in the same month. And then later on in the war, or in the same, in the 44, October 44, it had the minor changes removed. But it is the actual same aircraft, which I didn't realize before doing this. Um, so it has um, four kill markings on the nose, and then it has the uh, Daddy Rabbit is the name, which is actually interesting. So as I'm thinking of this, as I'm doing this video, here's the plan when I build this model. So I'm going to paint it up. And it's the, uh, the scheme is actually RAF dark green over RAF medium sea gray, because these aircraft would have been delivered uh, to the combat um, in a bare metal scheme. And then they were painted locally in England with English paints. So it's an RAF paint. But what I'll do is I'll lighten the color up and I'll paint the entire airframe in a lightened version of the green uh, and, and weather it pretty, not, I'm gonna say pretty heavily, but I'm gonna do some weathering, you know, fade the rudder, uh, make it look like it has, uh, you know, done some combat, been through some things. And then, because it was an earlier plane that got repainted into a later plane, I will actually darken some areas. For example, this whole nose section will have a slightly darker green where it was painted over Daddy Rabbit and Glamorous Glen 2 was then marked on. So I'll do some darken, darker paints to have like some, where well, they painted over these markings, painted over these markings, painted over the J's and then everything else got added. So I'll do a little bit of that, so it looks like it was an older plane that got re, uh, renamed. I don't know if it's 100% accurate, but I like that idea, and that's what I'm gonna do. So that's the second aircraft that's included, uh, Daddy Rabbit, uh, from July of 1944, flown by Captain Charles Peters um, of the 363rd Fighter Squadron. Third aircraft, another P-51D-5, the early one, does not have the tail fillet. This one was flown by Captain William O'Brien, again, of the 363rd Fighter Squadron in July of 1944. Uh, and the name they used was uh, Billy's Bitch. And this one has um, six kill markings on it. Uh, they used the German mark. So here you can see it's a black and white, um, black and white, I can't think of the name right now, swastika. Here they use the, the standard German markings, whereas on Chuck Yeager's aircraft, they use the actual German flag, the white and red flag with the... the the swastika in the middle. So each one has a slightly different type of kill marking depending on what the pilot's preference was. So anyways, back to aircraft number three. So 4413522, Billy's Bitch, from the 363rd Fighter Squadron, July of 1944. That one's a little interesting just because um, the uh, G, the, the, the rear um, white part of the, actually all the invasion stripes are just slightly in a different place. So the invasion stripes look like they're shifted aft on this aircraft and the aircraft letter is in black in the white section instead of the rest where the white section is off. So it's just one of those things you gotta keep your eye out where they are off slightly and just centered a little bit in a different place. So that's option number three. Option number four, uh, 4413581. Again, a uh, early model P51D. This one is flown by Major Edwin Hero. Um, three German kills markings, uh, name is Horses Itch. Uh, this one also has invasion stripes on the bottom of the wings. It's the first one we've seen right now that has... No, oh, no, I take that back. Billy's Bitch had uh, invasion stripes as well. So each aircraft is a little different, so you really have to pay attention to the markings you're doing and make sure that you do the right markings. Um, this one's also interesting because the invasion stripes, um, although they are in the similar location, uh, the squadron code is painted uh, very differently. It's got the black 6 and a black D, and the 6 is really off in terms of its... Uh, um, it's, it's font, so it's just an interesting aircraft. But uh, anyways, so you can see where the white has been repainted in black after the invasion stripes were applied. So that's uh, option four. Option five, um, four, four, one, four, seven, nine, eight. Uh, this particular aircraft was flown by 357th Fighter Group's Ops Officer, Major Joseph Broadhead. So he's a, um, from the uh, wing level, not from the uh, squadron level. And this is from January of 1945, so significantly later than some of these other aircraft. Uh, so this one's called um, Master's Mike, Master Mike. Um, and it's interesting as it's got a large number of bombing missions and German kill markings on it. Um, and it's got the pilot's name across the lower part of the canopy. 
Uh, and there's no invasion stripes at all on it, so it's a little bit of a different design from the other ones again, something a little bit different. Uh, each aircraft, as I said, is very unique, so that makes it for interesting, uh, some interesting schemes. Uh, so aircraft number six, we're now moving into a, a slightly different time. Um, and also you can see the difference between the different units, whereas, for example, aircraft, uh, the 363rd fighter squadron, uh, which you can see of all of these, have the green over gray, whereas the um, 362nd fighter group, which you'll see here, even though they're from the same time frame, it's bare metal with just the green on the top. So it's a slightly different scheme. And this aircraft here is 4413316, again, 362nd fighter squadron, um, in June of 1944, the name on the nose, Mildred. And as I said, you'll see it's an RAF dark green over bare metal. And then the invasion stripes are full invasion stripes around the rear fuselage, where again, over here, they were just uh, partial invasion stripes. Um, so that's one's that. Uh, next aircraft, again, this is a D5, so no tail fillet. Uh, so here we go, uh, another D5, no tail fillet, 4413316. So it's actually the same aircraft as uh, the one above here. Uh, so this was in June of 1944. This was in July of 1944. So you'll see really the only difference, same aircraft code, same round L, same everything, except instead of the name Mildred, it now has the name Nookie Bookie 2, and it's flown by Captain Leonard Carson. Um, so that, again, you see the same aircraft as it progresses through the time in the war. You'll also notice that the upper part of the invasion stripes have disappeared on, uh, on the later version. Uh, so both of those are classified as aircraft number six. It just has a different name. So aircraft number seven, uh, four three one three five eight six. And why do I feel like I've seen five eight six before? No, nope. I'm going crazy. So five eight six. This is from the three sixty fourth fighter squadron. So now we have a new fuselage code C five instead of the B six or the G four. Uh, so again, it's a D five, no tail fillet, bare metal with the RAF dark green on the upper surfaces, and the name Hurry Home Honey. This one was flown by Major Richard Peterson. Uh, so again, only lower invasion stripes on the uh, on the fuselage. And the final option, option number eight, is another uh, late model P-51 D-10. It has the fin fillet, and it is a 4414245. It's flown by Lieutenant, or, sorry, Lieutenant Otto Jenkins from the 362nd Fighter Squadron. Um, and it has the uh, G4 code from 362nd. A couple of uh, code markings here and the name Flugi2, Flugi2, Flugi2. And again, RAF darker green over medium sea gray. And it's got a very interesting camo pattern on this one. Uh, if you can see, it's a very like scalloped camo pattern, which I've never seen really before, but um, being that they were painted in the field, they had these ability to do some of these variations as they saw fit uh, for their combat. Um, so that's uh, six, seven, and eight. That's all of that. So that's all eight options you have on the decal sheet. There's also an info sheet provided. So on one side, it gives you some uh, markings on how to do uh, things like with the white, uh, white stripes, 12 inch and 15 inch stripes, and then your 18 inch um, invasion stripes. Um, shows you how to get a bunch of those details done. Uh, it even gives you notice that uh, some of the aircraft have a slightly different underwing. Um, invasion stripe layout. It looks like the white stripes were slightly wider than the other ones, or they're offset in a different place. But uh... so yeah, it's interesting to see how that all fits together. Um, but I mean, it gives you, it shows you where the stripes would be located, uh, how the invasion stripes get put together. Uh, there's two different markings that you see in the decals. Two different versions of the round L. Some are white, some are gray, depending on whether they had the, the uh, toned down version of the invasion of the uh, roundel. I'll use the standard roundel. I'm not a big fan of the toned down version. And then on the back side is an information section that gives you a little bit about the history of the unit as well as what they did and uh, some of their missions and um, notable events. Um, so then we also talk about the camouflage. Um, so it tells you that the aircraft were painted with RAF supplied stocks of dark green, medium sea gray. Um, uh, with a directive that the group was to be going to be deployed to the European continent after the invasion and required some topside camouflage. Um, so, I mean, he says there is, they're not entirely sure. He went with the RAF stock colors and the decals because the evidence says that's most likely what they use and he had to pick something. Um, some believe it was olive drab over neutral gray and the other one was thought it was a mix between the two colors. Um, so, I mean, I might even do a slightly different one. It's, it, who knows? I'll have to do some research on this stuff, but um, 
But yeah, he also mentions that in the most case, they painted over the majority of the stencils when they did the painting because it was field applied camo. So, uh, you know, it gives you a billet of information on, on where they came from uh, with their thinking while doing this sheet. So very happy I got this. I now have a set of decals for that Airfix kit that I wasn't sure about. So we'll just quickly look at the decals themselves. So as I said, the roundels, you get both the white and the gray for the national insignias. Uh, so you can choose whether you want to use the two. This also technically means that depending on how you uh, play your cards, you have the ability to do two of these aircraft um, when you, uh, if you use both different types of roundels. So the decals themselves, beautifully printed by Cartograph. Um, Cartograph is a great company. I have no complaints about their uh, abilities at all to make decals. Beautiful looking decals. Everything's in register. Uh, very minimal, minimal um, carrier film, so it would be very little silvering when you do the sheet. So you'll see you get all the different fuselage codes and all the different numbers and, and, and names for every every aircraft. And then down here for your um, cowling um, stripes, the checkers, the, the nose, the, the spinner you have to paint yourself. But the checkers on the nose, they give you a number of different options to do that. So you get... Um, enough to do four different aircraft using um, standard decals. Then there's another two sets of decals that are just the red, which allows you to paint the yellow and then apply the red decal over top of that if that's the route you want to go. So technically you have enough stripes to do one, two, three, four, five, six full aircraft um, if you choose to do that many and so between if you have models and you have the decals the round markings that come out of the model you have enough cowlings plus all the decals you could technically do six of these eight um uh, aircraft in your uh as you build them so it uh there's quite a few options you can do there it's pretty interesting how many they uh, they give you um so yeah Pretty interesting. I'm very happy that I managed to find this uh, this sheet. Uh, as I said, it gives me the ability to do what I want to do. And because I'm only going to be building one of these, chances are there'll be other people looking for these decal sheets down the road, and I'll be able to you know pass off some of these unused decals to some other people. So there we go. That's the new product for the day. Uh, that is, like I said, the um, Bullseye Decals Yoxford Boys number one, which includes the reason I bought it. The um, yeah. The um, Chuck Yeager Glamorous Glen 2 markings. So I do have one new uh, model to show you guys that I got this month, uh, or in the past month. Um, it wasn't one I was planning on buying. It wasn't something that I had known I was going to get or was thinking about getting. Um, <clears throat> uh, as with most model purchases in the past little while, it's something that has been on my list of something I've wanted for a while to add this type of aircraft to the collection, but has been very difficult to find. And the kit showed up at the right price that made it worth purchasing. And um, the model that I ended up getting, uh, it was another large one, so it was a bit of a significant purchase. But um, all things considered, I probably paid about half of what this would normally retail for today. And that model is the Monogram B24J Liberator. So I do have a, uh, a D model. I get the lighting here. Did I get some of this reflection off of here for you guys? Um, I do have a D model um, in the stash. Um, that's the one that has the uh, the solid glass nose. But I was looking for one that had the turreted nose um, uh, for a very specific reason, and that's because the the glass nose D model that I have, I'm going to be building up as an RAF Coastal Command aircraft, and I wanted to do another B24 um, in an American scheme. So this is uh, I've been like I said looking on this for a while. I had a kit like this when I was a kid. Um, and I had a small issue with the wings not fitting properly on the fuselage. And uh, basically there was a huge gap. And for whatever reason, I just looked at it, gave up, and trashed the kit. And I mean, I really wish I didn't do that at the time. Because if I hadn't, I probably still would have had that kit laying around. And I would have been able to rebuild it. And I wouldn't have had to spend the money I spent on this. Um... But yeah, I know as I was, you know, with the, with the, the, the musings of uh, I would have been in grade four. So a 10 year old, 12 year old kid, you know what I mean? It wasn't really a primary like, you know, idea of what I wanted. It wasn't a, a, 
I didn't have the patience to deal with issues like that. So when the issue showed up and I didn't really have the, you know, how do I want to put this? I didn't have the knowledge that I have now in terms of the longevity of things. So for me, it was just, ah, it doesn't work. It's broken. I get something else. Chuck it. Forget about it. 10 year old, 12 year old. That's what they do. As an adult now, I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I had spent the time to get it done right. I'm going to take the time with this one to make sure it is done right. But anyways, it popped up on Facebook Marketplace. Uh, even having to be shipped to me from Quebec City, it was still, uh, like I said, half of what I would pay for this um, based off prices on things like, you know, eBay. I know which isn't the best market value, but prices on eBay and things like old model kits and whatnot, I paid um, about half of what it would totally cost me to have it purchased elsewhere. So I was pretty happy with... Uh, with the purchase. So I'll quickly, quickly go through the details of this kit. Um, very quickly go through the details. I will do a full model review on this at a later date, a full video. This is just gonna be a quick once over of the kit. So it comes in that standard monogram box with these little foldy flaps. This is kind of standard for the time. Uh, same box that the B17 and I believe the DC3 all fit within the same box. Um, so it's a pretty standard size box. So, We'll start off with the um, sprue that also includes the fuselage have. If you haven't seen um, the uh, B24 video, um, I do have it. It's not a full well, video. Really. I don't think I did the B24 now that I think about it. I don't think I've done a review on that one yet. So I will do a review on both the D model and this um, J model at some point in the future. So you get a good, get a good look at it. Um, but um, it's a very beautiful, it's typical of that late seventies, early eighties monogram um, molding, uh, raised panel lines, decent detail. It's more or less, you know, it's accurate for what it should be. There are, you're starting to see some flaws in the molding. Um, I mean, some of these details are a little, um, a little, uh, much for today, you know, in terms of the size of the rivet heads and stuff like that. There is some issues with the molds. The molds are showing their age. This kit, let's see, what is the date? Is there a date on this box? This is, uh, this box is, is copyrighted on uh, 1995 and the instructions are copyrighted in 1990. So this kit was probably punched out sometime in the late 90s. So it's already, you know, it's 20 years old now. And it would have been probably 20 years old. The molds would have been 20 years old, uh, give or take, from when this model was punched out. So you are starting to see some issues. As I said, some of these details are getting a little soft. Uh, you're not seeing as crisp um, molding around some of these as you'd like. Uh, inside the... Trap, I'll actually zoom in here. You can see this inside the tracks for the Bombay, you're starting to see um, artifacts where either there was damage to the mold or somehow the plastic seeped inside where there should have been a raised line. I would suspect, and then there's a real thick gouge here. It's all <laughs> zigzaggy where it goes through here and it lines up with that damage. I would almost suspect that there was damage to the mold and they quickly tried to repair it and it didn't turn out the best, and so it's punched out some, some damaged um, damaged molds. But, I mean, you're also seeing a lot of weird flow lines. I'm not sure if you can make that out in the plastic. Some really weird flow lines in the plastic. Uh, looks like the plastic either went in too hot or too cold, or it could just be the mold themselves are starting to show their age. And uh, even back here, you can start to see how there's some really weird, um, some really weird plastic uh, lines following see if I can get a good angle so I can get rid of some of the glare here so you can see what I'm trying to point to you. Oof, it's not going to be easy to get this. Uh, across this, uh, let's see, you know what, I don't think I'm going to be able to show this to you. The light is just not cooperating with me today. There, ah, there we go. There's this wavy line right here. There's some there and you get back into here and you see these weird little wavy lines in the corners. It's like the plastic was cooling um, as it was coming close to some of these panel lines, there's another line follows in through here. You can see there's a wavy line. So if I get that angle right again, there we go. There's a wavy line below that panel line. There's a wavy line between that panel line. You start to see all these weird wavy lines in the corners. They don't seem to have any um, 
distortion in the plastic. It's just the color, which just tells me that the plastic was a weird temperature going in or the molds had issues and they were fighting the molds to get this to punch out. So this might have been one of the last um, J models. I'll have to look at the, the data and see when these things were punched out. Um, how many, uh, if there were any molds punched out after this, because you're definitely starting to see issues with the way the plastic was injected and the way that it's interacting with the molds. So I definitely feel like this is near the end of the production run of these aircraft. Um, unless you retool, which you're looking at tons and tons of money. I mean, you can see here the amount of flash that's happening in here. And if you look, there's a sprue gate here. This is where it actually injects the plastic into the model and it's a rotating gate. So it turns to open plastics injected and then it turns to close. Um, and you can see how um, it's misshapen, which means that that wasn't completely open. You see how it's all misshapen? So normally it's a valve that would turn, it would line up the holes and the, and the hot plastic is injected in and then that would turn um, shut and then the plastic would cool and then it would open up and punch out the, the kit. Um, and you can clearly see how those lines don't line up, which means it's possible. And you can even see a weird um, distortion right here where the plastic kind of made a thing. So it's possible even that um, um, the plastic was put in too hot, so it hadn't uh, it hadn't fully cured, or either that or the mold wasn't fully opened, and that's why you're getting all of these distortions. Is that the uh, there wasn't the, the the hot plastic was cooling too much, and that's where all this flash came from because this wasn't closed tight. All this plastic oozed out from that open valve and and solidified. So I, I have a feeling that there's an issue with the uh, the dies, um, the uh, the dies are a certain show their age. Anyways, I, I went too much on that little section right there, so we'll move on a little bit. But anyways, this this it includes both fuselage halves. The other half has just uh, broken off, and again, same thing, same distortions all along the panel lines. Um, weird swirls in the plastic. So yeah, there's definitely something going on with the molds. A lot of soft, soft, soft details. Places where it should be really sharp corners has come off really soft. So, um, anyways, uh, inside of the fuselage, typical um, monogram bombers. You've got a lot of. I'll zoom in again here so you can take a look at it. You know, a lot of interior detail. You know, oxygen hoses molded in, uh, wires and, and hydraulic lines um, molded in. Again, you can just see how soft some of this detail is starting to look. Oxygen back here, the ribs, some wires and whatnot. So, I mean, it's not horrible. Um, there's definitely some interior detail. The other side of the fuselage, I believe is for the most part, no, it's not a mirror. It's actually, yeah, it's actually a little different. So they've done a bit of work in here to make sure they're different. So again, all the lines that are running, some hydraulic accumulators, some more panels and oxygen things. So they've done a bit of work. Same here on the bulkheads. You'll see there's a bunch of lines and wires running on the bulkheads, panels and whatnot. The, the uh, cockpit floor has a nice corrugated floor the way it would normally have. Uh, center pedestal isn't too, too bad. Uh, wood grain up here where it would have been a wooden uh, board on the bombier's, bombardier site. Same with the control surfaces. You've got that monogram sort of fabric -y, hash marked looking plastic to differentiate between the fabric and the aluminum. So it's not a bad mold considering it's the only 148 scale B24 on the market uh, and it's a 40 or that's about a 40 year old kit. It uh, definitely holds up to its age. Um, so it's, it's, you know, with a bit of effort, this can turn out to look like a very, very decent model. Uh, so moving on to the other sprue, I don't think these are numbered sprues, but um, second sprue we'll look at anyways includes the right wing. And again, you're seeing the same types of problems with the plastic going through, which means it probably wasn't that, that gate that was the issue because this one has a clean connection. It's probably something to do with the plastic. Uh, it's just leaving these weird distortions in the color. Anyways, so this includes your right wing, upper and lower half, so you can see the beautiful detail on the bottom here in terms of the wheel well and the um, turbochargers. And just while I'm noticing it here inside the wheel well, there is a copyright date of 2001. Um, so this was punched out in 2001. So, yeah. 
definitely near the end of its production run. Uh, you also get the upper half of the horizontal stabs. There's some bomb racks, parts of the landing gear, front landing gear, the main landing gears, those ubiquitous monogram um, bomber figures are included. The tug driver, the pilot, the mechanic, and the two standing figures. So those came in like B-17s, B-29s, the whole nine yards. They're pretty common figures. Well, parts of the gear door, you've also got the waste gunners um, compartment. Uh, as well as a bulkhead, uh, probably from behind the bomb bay. I don't know for sure without looking at the instructions. But um, again, you look inside here, look at how soft. Like it's internal, but you can start to see just how soft some, and all these weird, like the lines that should be straight are all super soft and super wavy in here. You can see where they've done a lot of work on the molds, um, filling in um, to, to strengthen the molds and ensure that they are, um, it, it literally just looks like someone took a welder and welded inside the, the, the molds and then never cleaned up the, the welding just to, just to strengthen the molds in order to punch these out. So this must be very, very, I'd be very interested to compare this to an earlier, um, an earlier molding of this kit, an earlier version of the kit, just to see how much more damage is included in these. Like here, you can see there's all kinds of tool marks, um, I'll zoom in on here. I'm, I'm way going way off topic on this because I'm going away from the model itself and talking about the age of the molds. But you can see there's all these tool marks here included on the kit, all these no notches and up here along the leading edges. You see, oh come on, focus. Here, you see there's all of these tool marks. That's all stuff that's been tooled up and marked on the molding itself, on the on the die. So there's been a lot of work done on the molds. Just looks like it was there's some welding was done to strengthen. The walls of the molding and whatnot of the of the dies. So, for sure, these dies were showing their age when they punched this kit out in 2001. Again, 2001. We're talking 20 years ago now. So, I would say the chances of seeing another 148 scale repop of this kit are very low. Looking at what these molds look like. So moving on to the last silver sprue, and it includes was the last silver sprue. Yes, last silver sprue. It includes the left wing upper and lower wings, the uh, lower half of the horizontal stab, some more bomb racks, the closed bomb door pieces, uh, and then you got some more stuff in here. You got antennas, you got ammo boxes, you've got some of the structure for the, excuse me, the ball turret, and you've got the, the, the waste gunner doors. Uh, let's see how much work was done on these molds. Anything? Uh, it doesn't look quite as bad. Yeah, definitely not as bad. Oh, you know, I, I say that, but no, you can clearly see how this has had a ton of extra extra reinforcing punched into there that didn't exist on the other kit. A lot of welding going on in there to strengthen the back of those molds. So yeah, it's showing on everything. But, uh, I mean, it is what it is, but uh, yeah. So that's the, uh, the other wing. Um, again, a lot of flaws in the plastic. It's not as bad, actually, but you can still see a few of them. Some flaws in the plastic molding, but when you feel run your finger over it, it's perfectly smooth. So the plastic at least hardened uh, properly. It's just when it was injected, it had some weird things going on with uh, temperatures. So the last major sprue we have is, again, when it comes with monogram, it's ubiquitous. You always get a black sprue, and it includes the wheels, the props, the guns, the instrument panel. Anything that would be painted a darker color comes in the darker plastic, where everything that gets painted sort of an airframe is either gray or a silver, depending on what the main color of the plane is going to be. Uh, this B24 kit also includes a tow tractor. Um, so you see it's got the engine compartments, this chassis, part of the engine here, the compressor, I should say, for the back, the tracks, and there's some more of the seats and whatnot over here for that tractor. So if you wanted to do it up, it also includes a tow bar um, right here. Uh, so you can add the tow bar and the tug and uh, towing the plane if you want to do a little diorama kind of setup. So that's included in there as well. Um, but again, uh, you know, things like the machine guns, uh, these are all sort of standard monogram machine guns. Looks like they recycle the same mold, the same pieces from plane to plane to plane. Um, between you know, B25, B17, B29, B24, same with that, that Norden site looks identical to the B17 stuff. 
you know, these prop uh, shafts look the same. Uh, the wheels have, uh, they're, they're nicely molded, a lot of good detail on the hubs. It includes the, um, the flattened spot for weight on wheels look to make it look like the heaviness of the plane pushing down on the wheels. Uh, the um, forward bulkhead there, the instrument panel, it's not bad. I'm actually impressed with the B24 instrument panel. Monogram did spend a lot of time and money getting this looking nice. Let's see if I can get it to focus. Come on, there we go. So you can see it's it's looking soft now. As I said, this is a 20, 20 or 30 year old mold when this was made, but it's got all those little instruments, all the little details, the dials, everything is, is in there. So it's, it's very well done. Um, compared to some of the other kits of the age where it's just a flat panel or grossly, grossly inaccurate. So it's got some detail on the instrument panel. It's got some decent detail on that Norden bomb site. Again, if it would focus. It's got some decent detail on that Norden bomb site. It, you know, painted up weathered. That would look very close to a real bomb site. Uh, it's also, you get a couple of bombs. You get what? One, two, three, four, five. It looks like six... 250 or six 500 pound and then either 4,000 or four 500. I don't know what the exact weights are. It's probably 500 pound bombs and thousand pound bombs. Uh, so you do get a bit of a bomb load to put into that if you do choose to do the bomb load. So it's a very nice kit overall. Decent detail again for a, for a 1970s, early 80s uh, monogram mold. You're definitely getting what you pay for. Uh, these days those kits go for quite a bit of money. Like I said, those 17s you know, you're looking, the B-17 isn't as much. They tended to pop those out a lot more. Um, if you're looking for a B-17, you're looking $30 to $50 US for that 148th um, B-17. Some of the rarer boxings, the Pro Modelers, the clear uh, fuselage piece, the visible B-17, those go for quite a bit more. You're looking into the $100, $100 over $100 range. Uh, these B-24s, you're looking, you know, somewhere in that $100 to $150 US range. And those B-29s, I mean, like I said, Ravel of Germany is repopping that B-29 now. It's going for well, close to $300 Canadian, $190 US, I think, is what the MRSP is for that brand new model. So these have, these have their value has retained, uh, so to speak, over the years. Um, so here's the clear parts you get uh, for the B-24. The bomb aim mirror of the window is actually in the box. It popped off. But you get a nice canopy, nice clear transparency. It's just quite a bit of distortion in there. So it's, it's a very... The, the, the plastic thickness changes quite a bit between the parts, but I mean, it's to be expected for this age of kit. But you get the uh, the cockpit here. You've got the forward turret and the tail turret here. Um, two built in halves, and hopefully it's designed. I have to look at it again. That that seam doesn't run through the middle of the turret, but probably does because of the age of the kit. Uh, side windows for the cockpit, a bunch of the fuselage windows in here, the top turret, and the ball turret, which again is just the same ball turret that's included in the B-17 kit. But anyways, that's the uh, the clear sp uh, parts that you get. They look really good, very little scratches, there's no distortion. I mean, there's distortion in the plastic just from the nature of the shape, but I don't see very much distortion in the plastic in terms of mold imperfections. Um, actually, you know, yeah, there's quite a bit actually in this top turret. I spoke too soon. You can see quite a few uh, weird lines and stuff built into the clear. So it's, it's again, showing its age. Um, but, you know, uh, that's that. The instructions you get are the standard monogram style instructions from that time. Uh, sort of one big sheet of paper that gets folded down into many different uh, sections. So you've got, um, sort of, you start with sort of this section. You can paint callouts. Typical monogram paint callouts are very generic. Just things like flat black, interior green, olive drab. There's no FS numbers. There's no ANA numbers. So you just have to do your research and say, you know, what colors go inside the dark gray. Well, what color dark gray? You know, you got to figure out. Do your research if you really want to make it accurate to make sure that you get the right shades of color in the right places. Um, but you go nose wheel, go into cockpit, turrets, uh, waist gunners positions. You move into the bomb bay with the different bombs. Um, whether you decide to attach them or not, it tells you what to do here. Uh, go through the other side of the bomb bay with its bombs. Uh, cockpit gets installed. And then on the back side, it's one big sheet. But you move on through more of the interior windows, gluing the fuselage together, putting the turrets, moving into engines, engines, put the wings on, then you do the other side. Uh, main landing gear, tail, uh, details around the cockpit. Excuse me. <sighs> Excuse me. Um, Bomb aimer window, nose gear doors, 
Bombay is open or closed, uh, ball turret, it gets placed in at a much later time. This is one of those weird things where you kind of want to be careful because I would be doing this before I would be doing the Bombay's because if you would close, if you, you can get your finger inside to help place um, that uh, ball turret where as if you are doing it with the window, the Bombay doors closed, you can't get in there anymore. But anyways, top turret. Uh, top turret goes in place, tail stand. There's a boarding ladder, which also doubles as a tail stand. Uh, so it's there's not a lot of space to put weight in this kit, so you'd have to really play with it and figure out how much weight you need to put in uh, to get it to balance. Tape it all together, put the gear on it, and then kind of play with the, the, the mount, see if you could even do it. Hard to say. Um, then you do the tow tractor. The last section here is assembling the tow tractor and getting it finished off. And then on the back side is the painting. There's only one... Um, scheme included. Um, I have to do the research actually to find out what unit it was assigned to because it doesn't say anything on here. Uh, but it's a generic scheme, all silver, all of drab on the uh, front of the cockpit there, the anti-glare panel in front of the pilot. And then the rest of the aircraft is all bare aluminum. And there's a flat black uh, sort of quarter painted on the tails so on both sides. So the bottom half of the tail is flat black. Otherwise, it's all silver with the gray, the uh, green um, leading edge. Uh, sorry, Ugh. the green anti-glare panel in front of the camera cockpit. My God, for whatever reason, I cannot talk today. Um, so it's not very colorful. It's not very unique. It's a pretty bland scheme. I have been looking at aftermarket decals for this. Don't know what route I'm going to go down yet because there isn't a lot out there. Um, especially what's available now. Uh, there isn't a lot. There was a lot more in the past, but a lot of stuff has become unavailable. So I need to do some research, see if there's any cool schemes out there that I like. There's the, always the, the classic, uh, the dragon and her tail. I'll throw a picture up here now of that one where the whole side of the plane is painted up with an amazing uh, dragon with a woman on the nose. And, and it's colorful, but it's been done so much. I'd like to do something a little different. So I'd have to do some research and see what is out there. Um, I don't know if I'm going to do this one in olive drab or in uh, silver. Uh, I don't know. I might do it silver just because when you look at the bigger planes that I have, um, I've got the th three, four B-17s, three of which will be done in olive drab. And then I have two or three C-47s, two of which will be in olive drab. The B-29 will be in olive drab. The other B-24 will be done up in... Um, um, uh, camo, the RAF camo. So in reality, this might be a uh, a candidate for uh, an, all, an all metal scheme to uh, to show off that look, but I don't know. Um, it's also an older kit, so doing outclad on this will be very very difficult because of the raised panel lines. So it might be worth it to do this in a, in a camo scheme and just hide a lot of the. Um, issues that is going to come around when I do the final painting, but I don't know yet and we'll figure that out when I get to it. The decals, typical monogram, uh, not a very big sheet. There is no stencils whatsoever for this kit. It is literally just um, the, um, the roundels, the mark, the, the fuselage codes you get in between. It's a little hard to see. There's decals here and decals here for the props. You get the markings for the tail. You get the marking for the uh, left side of the nose and the marking for the right side of the nose. And it's called on defense. It's a little bit of a pun there, but um, that's it. There's no stencils. There's no nothing. So I'd have to do a lot of research on the B-24, see what's involved in doing up a fuller scheme. In the future, I will be doing, as I said, a more in-depth look at this model. Uh, I'll compare it with the the, the, the uh, D model I have. We'll go through the instructions and a little bit more of a uh, detailed look. So that will come out in the future. I do not have a timeline for that yet. Um, I don't know. I've been doing uh, recently a lot with the built models. So we'll see how that goes. But anyways, that is the B24 review. So uh, thank you for sticking out for this long. And uh, let's move on and uh, see what's up next. So next up, it's another coin. And this is actually a pretty special coin because it's one of the coins that I didn't have to pay for. So a bit of a backstory, we have some pilots at work, or a pilot at work, I shouldn't say, who also does some flying on a part-time basis for DND. And I had asked them if the unit, I'm not gonna give out too much information because I don't want to you know, give away anybody's name or whatnot, but so I asked him if his unit 
um, provided or had any Dika uh, coins for sale. Sorry, my mind's all over the place here. I asked him if his unit uh, had challenge coins for sale, um, as I was a challenge coin guy, and I'd kind of like to collect challenge coins. Uh, he then said, you know, I'll get back to you. So he looked into it and came back and said, no, I don't have any, the unit doesn't have any coins. And I looked through my stuff at home and I don't have any coins. I've never collected coins. Um, otherwise I was offering to, you know, buy a few off him if he didn't really want them anymore. Not a lot of people buy coins. They, they're given to them or they're, you know, they acquire them and they have no interest in them. Um, but he did not have any in any, any way. So that was the end of the conversation. I moved on, you know, it was a shot, didn't work out, whatever. Not too long ago, he came through and he said, Hey, you're a coin guy, right? And I said, yes. And he said, the other day I was doing a flight and I flew a bunch of guys and one of them gave me a coin and I don't want it. So I'll give it to you. I offered to pay for it and he said, no, it's yours. So I said, thank you. And it's a very interesting coin because of all the coins I have, of all the coins I have, and I've, I've gone through all of the coins, they're all there um, in the different videos. Of all the coins I have, all of them are aviation related except for four. I have a vice presidential, I guess you can call that one too. I have the vice presidential aircraft security coin. I have the US ambassador Kelly Craft coin. I have an RCMP coin and I have uh, the commandant of the Marine Corps, uh, Admiral Bob Papp. So those are the only four coins I have that aren't aviation related. And I can add this one to it. This coin, um, this coin is actually a naval coin. It's a Canadian, a Royal Canadian Navy coin. And it was provided to him by the guys who flew. And I'll zoom in here a bit so you can take a look at this. Hopefully my, my battery doesn't die. The camera's getting a little low on battery here. So this is a submarine training coin. So it says it's the Sea Training Submarine, Sea Training Submarines, and it's got the logo, which I'm assuming is, I'm assuming that's the Naval Crest. I'll have to look up that up. I don't know the Navy very well. I'm pretty sure that's the Royal Canadian Navy's crest. Um, sea Training Submarines on the back side. You've got the, this is the, you know how pilots have wings? Well, this is what submariners wear. It's the two, uh, like, whale-type design around the central crest. And underneath it says Dolphin 72A. And again, I haven't done as much research on this, but I'm assuming Dolphin 72A is the training course. It's course 72A for Canadian submariners. Again, I'll have to look that up and see... Um, exactly what that means. I haven't even done that yet, but there you go. So that is a very interesting coin. Um, I'm sure these are one of the coins that you cannot purchase. They were only given and uh, luckily enough, it made its way down through the chain and I ended up with it. So very happy with that. I'll add that to the, uh, to the shelf, uh, just so people can uh, see it. I mean, it's, it's, it's not something that fits with my collection, but again, being given to me, uh, it's an interesting coin. So I like the design on this back. It's very simple. It gets the point across. Um, and, and you can also see with some coins, um, I'll find one here that has um, a number on it. I don't know if I have any. Here we go, for example. This is the one from the uh, 162nd Fighter Wing in Tucson. You see how it's got this, this engravable area here? What that means is this is a standard coin that they have. And if they want to engrave anything on it, they just engrave on this plaque. And that's how they manage to make custom coins for a person or a thing or a date or whatever it is. And that becomes a custom coin. This is an unengraved blank, which they can then sell to people. And it means that they only have to do one design. They do the design and then from there, they just have to get engravings done. It doesn't cost them anything else to do a special one-off coin, save the engraving. On this coin, the course is actually stamped into the coin. Uh, which tells me that either they redesigned the coin for every class or this is a one-off coin that this class designed. Again, I haven't done the research. So as predicted, my battery did die, uh, but I took the time while my camera was charging to look up uh, the details of this Dolphin. Uh, Dolphin 72A. So it turns out, based off what I can tell, this is strictly a Submariner's coin. It isn't specific to any one course or anything, and that would be why this is stamped and not just engraved every time the course changed. So I looked up Dolphin 72A, and it took me a while to find this. So apparently, the Royal Canadian Navy Submarine Fleet created what's known as the Dolphin Code. And apparently, it's been adopted by many Western navies or used by many Western navies and known worldwide. Uh, there's rumors that even the Russians used this code at times um, in the, uh, during the Cold War. So basically, 
if you're gonna pass a dolphin code, you basically say dolphin 72A. Uh, but I mean, for example, just reading through the list, things like dolphin six would be during the last action, you displayed noticeably suicidal tendencies. Or um, dolphin 11, I am unable to act as unevasively as you wish. So it's basically a way of passing sort of lighthearted joking messages back and forth between units in a code that was easy to pass. So, Dolphin, Dolphin 72 was um, something along the lines of like your last action. I wanna zoom, sorry for the sound quality, I'm sitting a little bit farther away from the camera right now. So I'll scroll down to 72. So 72 has uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different versions. 72A, 72B, 72C, etc, 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 etc. And it basically says, so A is very well done, Dolphin 72B is well done, Dolphin 72E is badly done, and you know, all the way down to uh, Dolphin 72G is don't do it again. So it's just a way of saying well done, Dolphin 72A. So it's a quick way of broadcasting a message in a code that unless you have the book or memorize the book, you have no idea what they're saying. Um, for example, 70, 70, your social event was 70A, first class, thank you, 70B, disastrous, all the way down to 70E, a crashing bore, better luck next time. So, I mean, you can, it's just a way of passing messages around between units, between submarines, between um, people on the ship or whatnot. So it's a very interesting code. Uh, so yeah, this is strictly a Submariner's coin provided uh, by a, a Submariner to said pilot who then passed it off to me. So I'm very happy with that. It's a very unique um, unique coin and uh, it'll just sit on my shelf with the rest of the coins and uh, that is that. So we're back again, uh, another two, uh, two new coins I'll go over uh, for this update. Um, I'm pretty sure I have a problem. <laughs> I, uh, just browsing uh, squadronswagshop.com uh, and again, I am not connected to that website in any way, but if anybody out there is a collector of patches, coins, stickers, anything that is um, squadron related, any of that uh, stuff that squadrons uh, sell, um, then I definitely recommend checking it down below in the comments. I'll put a link to uh, the site again. I think this is the second order of, uh, of coins that I've purchased through them. And uh, these two coins are, are ones that I had seen before and I passed up at the time. And as soon as I, you know, went back, I'm like, you know, I really wish I bought those because of where they're located and, and whatnot. And I figured, you know what, when they became available again, I'm going to jump on it. Because when it comes to military, you never know. Units move. They change bases. They stand up. They stand down. International bases expand, contract, expand, contract. So you never know when a certain unit will no longer exist or if they're going to move. And suddenly that coin or that patch from when they were based at a certain location becomes collectible because they're no longer at that location anymore. So I, uh, especially if people in the unit, if people, you know, 15 years from now f was part of that, and like, hey, I really wish I had that, that piece of memorabilia for that unit located at that base doesn't exist anymore. So I figured, you know what, I'm gonna jump on it. They're not that expensive, all things considered. These coins are 10 to $15 a coin. So at the end of the day, you know, you're not breaking the bank trying to buy them and they are cool to get. So as I said, I did get two. Um, the first one I'll talk about is uh, this one. It is the 44th Fighter Squadron. I'll zoom in here a little bit so you can see. Uh, 44th Fighter Squadron. Uh, and they fly um, F-15s out of uh, Kadena, Japan. So this is the front side, the Vampire Bat, uh, Vampire Bats, as the unit is called. So you've got that beautiful squadron logo Vampire Bat located on the front. Uh, and you can see that there's Vampire Bats and whoop, Eagle Driver at the bottom. If it will come back into focus. There you go, you can see it's this Eagle Driver, Vampire Bats, Eagle Driver. So that's the, the, the one side of the coin. The back side of the coin, it has the relief of an F-15. And you can see at the top, 44th Fighter Squadron, Kadena Air Base, Japan. So again, that's one of those things where, you know, it's going to be interesting because are the F-15s going to be retired? Are they going to move on to F-22s? Are they going to move on to F-35s? Are they going to move to a different base, you know? Um, there's still a lot of... Um, 
anti-US sentiment, I want to say, overseas. A lot of these US bases overseas, there's a lot of people locally uh, near the bases that don't like having them there. So who knows whether these are going to start to shrink in the future or not. Bases may move, aircraft get retired. So I jumped on the chance to grab that while I could. And the other one I got is the 35th Fighter Squadron. Um, and the 35th Fighter Squadron from Kunsan Air Force Base, Korea. I gotta look it up. I'm 99% sure these guys fly F-16s. Um, but I will look it up. If it isn't F-16s, somewhere here across the top, I will have a note pointing out what aircraft they actually fly. But I am pretty sure they do fly um, the F, uh, F-16. But that is the 35th Fighter Squadron, again, based in Kunsan, Korea. Uh, so who knows what happens, you know what I mean? If North Korea normalizes their relations, then you'll see a military drawdown in South Korea. So you might see these units pull out. So again, it was, you know, worth grabbing uh, when the uh, the chance came up. And uh, earlier on the video, with that Navy video, I was talking about how a lot of coins, I showed you the other one with the, uh, the, the Tucson F-16 unit. You can see here how they have a blank ribbon, and that's where if they want to make a specialized coin, they can engrave a pilot's name or a call sign or a date or something to immortalize a specific, you know, or an activity or a, a mission or something. And then these become a very personalized uh, thing. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's that. That is the 35th Fighter Squadron um, challenge coin um, that I bought. So that will mark the end of the coins. So you've seen the decal sheet. You've seen the three coins that I got. So at this point, we will start taking a look at the current stage of those four models. And you guys can see what, if anything, <laughs> I managed to get done in the past, uh, the past little while. So here we go. So here we are back at the desk. Take a look at uh, where I am with these four kits. So you're going to see some progress on some kits and you're going to see no progress on other kits. And it's probably going to be the flip of what you saw last month. Um, so I'll start off as usual with the zero and it's going to look absolutely the same as what you would have seen last, last, uh, <coughs> excuse me, last month. Uh, I have done basically nothing on this. I've been focusing on the other ones. So this is ready to go. I just basically need to do a light sanding in some places, excuse me, just to knock down a few high points and, and ridges from the, uh, from the primer. So just a very, very light, um, high grit sanding, probably like, a you know, an 800 or a thousand grit. Just give it a quick knockdown for some of these high points and then it is ready to go. Uh, next step on this, I'll be painting the wings um, silver uh, in, in preparation for um, doing the uh, salt chipping with the paint. So that's my next step on that. Uh, so that's the zero. Uh, P39, again, um, it looks exactly as you have seen it last time. I have got nothing new done on this. It again is uh, ready for paint. Uh, so the next step on this one uh, also will be the um, silver paint on the wings in preparation for uh, some, some paint chipping. Um, I do have to do a bit of research on the P39. I just want to take a quick look and see um, in terms of heavily weathered P39s if there was a primer coat underneath the paint. Uh, for example, if it was prime, if it was like a zinc chromate primer before paint, I can paint the zinc chromate and then put the paint on it and then chip that. So I need to do a little bit of research on that just to see whether it's going to be silver or a primer color. Uh, but the next step of that is laying a base color in preparation for some paint chipping. Other than that, I've done nothing on this and it is still in the same place as you saw last month. So where I've been putting my focus has been on the other two models, the F-15 and the C-45. So we'll start with the F-15 first. It is going to look significantly different than what you would have seen last month in that sense that it is almost complete and it is also very, very large. Uh, so I have the airframe assembled. Um, I have a primer coat put down on it. Um, the wings, I, I, I think I mentioned it in the last round of videos. Uh, the wings, the outer wing panels did not fit very nice at all. There's quite a bit of putty in there. I do have to rescribe a few panel lines. I'm not going to go crazy with it. Um, I just want to really, like, for some of them, just this side especially, they just disappear. So I just want to clean up some of those panel lines, just make them pop just enough to take a black wash when I paint this. 
Um, so I gotta clean that up a little bit, but otherwise the primer coat looks good and it is uh, basically ready to go with uh, paint. I am gonna do a bit of a, uh, a pre-shade on this, uh, paint some black in some of the more prominent um, lines. I'm not gonna do every little panel line, but just some of the major ones. And then uh, when I coat it in the Gunship Gray, it'll be a nice light coat and some of that will pop. And then I'm gonna darken the uh, Gunship Gray just a little bit and I'll do some touch up around some of the panels. Uh, as if they had done a few, you know, touch up paint jobs here and there. Just kind of give it a, a, I don't want to go crazy weathered, but I want it just a very, I'll see how it looks after I do a bit of a pre-shade uh, pre with a, th a, a, a thinned coat of Gunship Gray. Uh, see how it looks. If I don't like the look, I can go back after the fact and add um, a little bit of extra shading. So the cockpit, it is masked off. Uh, I did do, you'll see in a sec with the other canopy, I glued the clear pieces on and then I painted uh, black and then I painted the exterior gray. So if you look at it from the inside, you'll see black on the inside of the panel, the uh, uh, canopy, but from the outside you'll see the camo. Standard I've done for all the others. And I'm pretty sure I showed you last time, I've got foam uh, sponge, just dollar store kitchen sponge. I have down inside the intakes and I also used it on the wheel wells. Uh, it's, it's super easy to just pull out and put back in and it allows me not to have to worry about masking tape on the wheel wells and I think for the most part this is going to be um, where I go in the future. I bought it for the intakes and I realized it'll work well for landing gear. For example, things like that I'll never have to do again. I can just cut a piece of foam and jam the piece of foam in there and it'll be done. So this is where I'm gonna go with the future. It's like a dollar twenty-five for a pack of five or six and I've literally used barely any to do this plane. So it'll last me a little while uh, if I do that in the future. Uh, the CFTs, conformal fuel tanks, uh, on either side. Uh, they were a bit of a pain to put on. They had multiple twists in multiple directions. Uh, so I'll, I just had to work my way down, uh, you know, clamp and glue, clamp and glue, clamp and glue, work my way down bit by bit to get everything to fit. And then I cleaned up some of the edges uh, with some white glue to um, fill in some of the gaps. I'm not gonna go too crazy because in the real life planes, they're literally just kind of stuck to the side and there are some pretty thick gaps and, and, and um, it's not caulking per se, but there's like a, a filler between the tank and the fuselage. So if you look up close in real life, they're not perfect. So I'm not gonna worry too much about making them fit. They look great from a distance. I'm sure what you're seeing in this video, they look amazing, they fit. I'm gonna leave it as it is and just go from there. I also have to, after the fact that these areas back here will be painted in the titanium. So I need to uh, do some research and make sure I get that right with the CFTs and color and everything else. So I'm gonna play with that a little bit later, but that will come uh, closer to uh, the end with the painting stages and it'll actually be painted after I paint the gunship gray. So that'll be a later stage. But effectively what you're looking at now, it is ready uh, for paint. Things like uh, the rest of the pieces are on the intakes. They're ready to go. Uh, the, um, the air brake is still on the sprue, but I just have to cut it up, clean it up and it's ready for paint. I did do the tails. I got them with a coat. I had some extra primer left over in the cup after doing some painting. So I just quickly grabbed the, uh, the tails off of the, uh, the sprues, uh, hit them with a coat of primer just to make sure there were no issues with that. Um, but other than that, uh, the tails look like I can fit them on after paint. So I'll probably do that. Like I said, air brake is easy. The um, um, intake pieces are ready for paint. The only thing I really have left to do on this, I want to install um, the lower, um, uh, bomb rack. There's a lower bomb rack that fits on the bottom of this. I'm going to install that before I paint and then clean it up. The side ones, there's three that go on the side. Uh, they will have to be put on after paint and decal, but I'm going to basically install those bottom um, bomb racks uh, into place and then everything else, the wing pylons, the center pylons, the different um, pods up here, everything else will be painted separately and I'll attach to the airframe after paint. So I'm coming along, it's getting close. Uh, it's basically, other than a couple of, maybe an hour or two of, uh, of work, it is uh, ready to go for paint. So that is a good sign. Things are moving along with that. As I said with the canopy, I'll show that to you. I haven't primed the canopy. I'm just going to go over it with uh, the exterior gray color, uh, just to give it a bit of a variation in color. Uh, but you can see how I've, I've masked it all off, and then I use the black paint um, on the outside. So anywhere, if you look in, you'll see black. Outside, you'll see the gray. So that's the F-15. Final one is the CF-45, the uh, Beach 18. Still working away on that. It does look really good. Um, it is look, come, oh, coming along. 
Uh, so you can see I've got the base made, um, and then I, I mounted a aluminum tube inside the rear fuselage that that fits. And that just when this fits into place, there's no play of the airplane on the rod. It fits into that aluminum tube, which is epoxied in place at the top. And then I put a bunch of epoxy and super glue at the bottom, so it's not going to go anywhere. And then the plane, it, it, it's locked into place once it's epoxied into place. But as you can see, the C45 looks great. The fuselage is glued on the wings. I've done a little bit of puttying and sanding, uh, excuse the noise, putty and sanding into here. I have a little bit more to do in here. I'm gonna use some white glue to fill in that final gap on that side. And there's a little tiny bit on this side. It's not bad at all, it's mostly on this side. But that's cleaned up. The bottom uh, back here is all cleaned up and nice and smooth. The front part, a little tiny bit of work is gonna have to be done on that. It's looking real good, but I still need to do just a tiny amount of cleanup on that. Um, these inside corners are always a real pain to get looking good, but I do a little bit of cleanup on that. Uh, and other than that, um, it's pretty much done. I've got the uh, Astrodome in place. I'll have to, I might have to do some cleanup on that once I remove the masking. We'll see how that looks up. Uh, the tail is where the majority of the work needs to be done. So I just have a little bit of sanding, a little bit of work along these roots, just a tiny amount. And then the tail, I do have the horizontal stab glued together. This just needs to be cleaned up a little bit. And I just need to do a little bit of putty on the bottom part here to clean that up a little bit. But then that fits in uh, quite nicely into the rear fuselage. Um, it does have quite a tight fit, so it does take a little bit of fiddling around to get it into its proper location. But yeah, as you can see also, once it's glued into place, it's gonna be a little bit of cleanup needed to be done on the front of that as well. So it's just step by step. But once that's uh, done, like I said, clean up on the bottom of this, clean up the uh, the seams on the front, get it glued into place, clean up all the seams around that. I'll probably end up touching up all of these areas in here while I'm working here. And then it's just glue the tails on um, and it's basically ready for paint. This one is gonna be a fun paint job because the top of the fuselage is painted white. Uh, the wing tips, the horizontal stab, and the tails have red. Uh, the cowlings are black and then the rest of it is going to be outclad. So lots of different layers, lots of different stages, lots of masking, lots of playing with it. Uh, but it is coming along. It's going to look great once I get the base all set up. It's going to look... Uh, I'm happy with it. I'm very happy with this that it's going to get done. It's coming together a lot better. As long as I don't screw up the paint, this will come out looking like a very good model. So uh, that is the status of the four kits. Um, so as I said, hopefully in the next month, uh, by the time you see the March update fingers crossed you'll see uh, paint on some if not all of these so that's the status of the models it has been a longer video than usual i do apologize for the longer video i did have quite a few products to go over things i wasn't expecting stuff roll over from last month so thank you for sticking it out uh stay tuned i do have some more stuff coming out later this month and um yeah we'll uh we'll see you in a little bit so uh thanks for watching have a good one Thank you for watching guys, and as always, if you are interested in any of the content you see, you can access my website at www.shawns-aviation.com. Uh, you can see all the uh, latest pictures of aircraft and museums and the build logs of all of my current models and past models on that site. And if you're interested in any of this content, uh, please click the subscribe button here on uh, YouTube to follow more. Thank you very much, and see you guys next time.